For many, many years, I ran our university education program, which is no longer a part of the Institute's programs, um, but it was very near and dear to my heart. So I'm really happy to be here speaking with students and look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. I cannot see the chat um, as I present, but I'll, I'll pause occasionally. Feel free to interrupt me with questions um, or you know, break break in if something's really pressing. Otherwise, I'll pause occasionally, and Guillermina can see if, um, or she can she can relay your questions perhaps from the chat. So I'm here to speak to you about biomimicry, of course, and we'll get into just what that is and isn't. Advancer is not working here. Um, sometimes it can be really helpful to think about what biomimicry is not in order to understand what it is. So we'll touch on both. And then I'll go deeper into how emulation actually works with some specific case studies. And then at the end, I'll, I'll share a few tools and resources with you. And then hopefully we'll have time for some conversation as well. Okay, so what is biomimicry? We often just talk about it as nature-inspired innovation here at the Biomimicry Institute. We really emphasize sustainable innovation. Um, and so that's, that's our focus here at the Institute and it's part of how we define biomimicry is really thinking about that sustained, sustainability piece. Um, but on the emulation part of biomimicry, it's really about looking to the natural world natural world for ideas to solve challenges facing humans. I have a bit of a numb tongue from the dentist. So if I trip on my words occasionally, that's why. So um, biomimicry is not a brand new idea. The name is kind of new, but innovators throughout history look to nature and indigenous cultures closely observe. <laughs> I will ask, Leandra, can you mute yourself? Nope. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so again, biomimicry is not a brand new idea, but the name is kind of new. And innovators throughout history have really looked to nature and many indigenous cultures have closely observed and continue to closely observe the natural world for clues to survive and adapt in their environments. And this is where, we're starting to think about this idea again, at least Western culture um, or you know, cultures that are not living as closely to the land or is not living as their indigenous ancestors did. We're starting to realize that, oh, in fact, we still need to do that even in our modern world. Um, so the term biomimicry is really made up of two words, bios meaning life and mimesis meaning to copy or emulate. So it's not, even though bio, even though mimesis could mean copy, biomimicry is not about direct copy, copying. It's really more about emulation or learning from nature and then taking those lessons from nature and applying them in a human context. Biomimicry can be applied at a lot of different scales. Um, it can be applied to products as well as to processes and systems. And it also can be applied from the nano scale all the way up to the city or the ecosystem scale. There are a lot of related terms to biomimicry, um, biomimetic, and often that's used as an adjective. In Europe, um, I think in Switzer Switzerland, especially in Germany, you'll hear the term bionic. Biologically inspired and bio-inspired are also other terms. Again, here at the Biomimicry Institute, we often think of biomimicry as a subset of biologically inspired or bio-inspired design because it really has that sustainability lens to it. As I mentioned, you know, biomimicry has been practiced um, for millennia, really. Those cliff dwellings on the left are here in the United States and that indigenous population had to live very closely to the land, pay attention to the water cycles, to the nutrient cycles, to the climate. Um, and learn what they could from how desert organisms survived in that harsh environment. Um, and Leonardo da Vinci, of course, that's one of his drawings, and he famously looked to nature for all sorts of ideas. I'm sure this is an example that all of you are familiar with, and I realize we're, we're all on our, our separate computers and separate rooms, but just think for a minute. Um, 
about what this example might be. I'm sure some of you know, you can type it in the chat if you want, even though I won't see it. But this, um, this was the inspiration for Velcro. So Georges de Mestrel was a Swiss inventor. He observed that burdock seeds were very efficient at sticking to fur and fabrics. He'd gone out hiking with his dog and the dog came back covered in these burdocks. Um, and they're so efficient at sticking because they used hook, they use hooked barbs to snag fibers. And he translated that strategy, what he learned from that observation to his innovation for a completely new kind of fastener. Change Water Labs, based here in the United States, has developed a new way to dispose of human waste in a completely new way by evaporating out the water from the waste. So 50% of the world's population lives without safe, clean toilets because they live in places, in part because they live in places with no sewage plumbing. And to expand access to sewage plumbing, if you think about our, if you think about a modern city and or somewhat modern city, and all of the pipes and infrastructure that go into dealing with waste, that could potentially be a huge undertaking for a place that doesn't have the resources for their pipes. And it's also not the way nature would do it. So Change Water Labs came up for a with a completely new way to flush that doesn't need plumbing. Um, so their invention on the right there is called the Eye Throne. And it's a waste shrinking toilet to provide safe, clean sanitation to places where people can't flush. So it uses two patent pending technologies to get rid of waste on site. One is an evaporative material that quickly shrinks human waste by converting 90 to 95% of it into pure water vapor. And then the second element is actually a bio battery. It's powered by urine um, and it turns urine into electricity. And so this evaporative approach to flushing mimics how plants use evapotranspiration to pull moisture from soil and then releasing it as pure molecular water through stomata on their leaves. Um, so that picture on the left, um, the scanning electron microscope image shows a stomata on a leaf and, and where the water vapor exits from the leaf as it travels through the, through the plant. Go ahead. The state. No, the, uh, can I, I oh, okay. the participants to close your mic? Yeah, sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. So anyway, inspired by nature's recycling of waste into energy, um, Change Water Labs Biobattery uses symbiotic microbes to collaboratively consume and convert. Um, the urine um, into electricity, as I mentioned with the battery. This is a completely different way of dealing with waste. So um, nature purifies water all of the time. And John Todd ecological design took inspiration from natural wetlands to also find a way to address human waste. So on the right there, you see his living machine which is a chemical-free wastewater treatment system that efficiently strips nutrients from water through the interaction of many different organisms. Um, that system's located in Rhinebeck, New York, but there are sim similar technologies installed all over the world today. And there are many other companies that are, are doing um, similar things, both to treat wastewater from say food processing plants um, or at university dormitories, at any kind of large building facility, but they're also using similar technologies to clean up um, water in outdoor places where the natural vegetation is no longer there to do the job. And often they are doing that, or usually they are doing that in concert with, with living organisms. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So from these examples, we can see that biomimicry can be applied in many different ways. So it can influence the design of shapes and structures or forms that provide a particular function, just like the hooks that attach to fine fibers in the case of Velcro. It can help us develop better processes for doing things. Um, again, the example of quickly evaporating water from waste is an example of a process, a series of steps or operations to produce a result. 
And then biomimicry can also inform the development of integrated systems that serve a purpose. Um, so optimizing relationships and interactions of component parts in order to get the result. So here's where I'd like to talk a little bit about what biomimicry is not, and these clarifi clarifications could be helpful to you. So biomorphism is when something looks like nature, not necessarily functions like nature. So just because this car is painted to look like a cheetah, um, it doesn't function or work anything like a cheetah. So that's biomorph biomorphism rather than biomimicry. Um, however, um, biomimetic designs can also be biomor biomorphic. So not by default, um, but it can be both. So the Kingfisher, you've pro most of you have probably heard of this case study. Um, this is the Japanese bullet train. Um, and the nose of that train is modeled on the Kingfisher's beak. So the Kingfisher is a diving bird and its head and beak are very good at entering the water without a splash. If it created a splash, it would scare the fish away. So modeling the design of the train after the geometry or the form of the Kingfisher beak reduced the noisiness of the train and also helped the train travel 10% faster on 15% less energy. Um, so it's biomorphic in that the kingfisher's beak and the, the nose of the train look very similar, um, but it's also biomimetic because the nose of the train functions like the beak of the train. Um, by having that shape when the, tra the train travels faster and on less energy, but also when it goes through a tunnel, um, it no longer generates a pressure wave that, that when it bursts out of the tunnel used to create a, essentially a sonic boom. So it functions just as the kingfisher's beak functions to eliminate splash when it goes into the water. In the case of the train, it eliminates, um, or diffuses this pressure wave that builds up as the train would go through the tunnel. So biomimicry is also not the same as biophilia. So biophilic design focuses on humans' attraction to nature. Um, biophilic design makes us feel like we're in nature. And sometimes it can involve nature, as in the case of this um, classroom um, in Israel, but it doesn't necessarily function like nature. Um, you know, the, the plants there may or may not be purifying the air. It looks like some of the plants may be in the water. Um, yeah, I guess a few of the plants are in the water. So maybe there's a little purification going on there, but you can see the, the rounded, um, the rounded edges, right? So it's not, there are no, there are no right angles in nature. Everything's kind of curves and, and shapes that are pleasing to the eye. And so those can be part of biophilic design. And again, um, biophilic design can be biomimetic if functions are being um, emulated, but it's not inherently biomimetic. And biomimicry is also not Bioutilization. So, biotilization is when we use organisms or their parts in a design or technology. So, things such as corn based plastics, as this cup here, um, wood or cork products, fermentation. So, using natural materials can have many benefits, but it doesn't make something inherently biomimetic. Um, at the same time, at the systems level, Personally, I believe that biotilization is really essential for us to mimic nature systems. Microbes are everywhere, purifying our water, breaking down our waste, participating in the nutrient cycle. Um, and so we really need microbes. We don't want to create synthetic microbes, and it would be impossible anyway to, to mimic the billions of organisms that are out there probably doing these services, right? So... Um, Bio-utilization is when we use organisms or their parts in a design or technology, but biomimicry is really, at the systems level, is really when we use those organisms, or it can be when we use those organisms to accomplish certain functions, and again, at that systems level. So it's particularly useful in cases where replicating complex biological processes in our own technologies is either unsuccessful, too time intense too time intensive or too difficult to be cost effective. Um, 
So here's an example. I mentioned the, you saw the image of the John Todd ecological machine. Here's a similar technology, Biohaven Floating Islands. This company is actually based in my home state, which is Montana. Um, and these are biomimetic self-sustaining floating treatment wetlands. And again, designed to remove excess nutrients and other contaminants from lake streams and wastewater lagoons. And the islands typically use a combination of um, bacteria, algae, algae, fungi, and plant growth to effectively take up, precipitate, and or filter nutrients and other pollutants from water. And again, these have been installed all over the world um, to really clean up wastewater that we humans generate. Biomimicry is also really a new way of seeing and experience, experiencing nature. Instead of learning about nature, how many board feet we can get out of a tree, um, what its range is, you know, what humans can use it for, it's rather about learning from nature, looking at what organisms and ecosystems do and how they work. And nature becomes a lot more magical for kids and adults when it's not just about memorizing facts. Um, it's also about close observation and experimentation. In the case of the tree, you know, why might those leaves have irregularly rounded lobes? Why does the tree have leaves at all rather than needles? Are the leaves the same throughout the entire tree? Um, Observing closely can lead to new discoveries. And I can say, you know, I've worked here for a long time and almost on a weekly basis, I feel like I hear about some scientist that has discovered something um, just because it's something that might seem rather obvious just by paying attention. For example, um, how a cat's tongue is able to take up water from its bowl versus how a dog does it, right? Like those are things a lot of us can can observe right in our neighborhoods if not in our own homes, but we don't necessarily do it. And so um, there was another story recently about a scientist in Australia. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, um, but he studied spiders, but he happened to be walking home and saw a spider on a tree and realized he paid attention to it because he liked spiders, but he realized something entirely new about it um, and about the way spiders use their webs just because he paid attention. And anybody could have done that, right? They may not be able to understand it on the same level. They may not care to study it on the same level, but all of us have this power of observation and to learn from nature. And I think that's something really powerful about biomimicry. It's available to everyone. Um, and again, approaching nature with a childlike sense of wonder is really very helpful in beginning your biomimicry journey, trying to train your brain to look closely um, not just assume that a tree is a tree is a tree, or not even to be able to say, you know, that's a maple tree versus a ponderosa pine tree versus a red oak, but actually understanding how they dif differ in function. Um, looking at the role of the canopy, looking at how leaves are able to photosynthesize. Um, how can a tree withstand hurricane force winds or not? Um, what are what are the conditions that make it able to tolerate 120 degrees when um, when humans can't? Things like that, right? Like what makes what makes this tree what it is? So learning from nature instead of learning about nature. So you're studying design. Um, there's a translation function between the biology and design language, and that is really function. So instead of thinking about what you want to design, instead of saying, I want to design this thing, in biomimicry, you ask, what would your design do? And in nature, a function is something an organism or living system must do in order to survive um, and persist. Um, and function is really, an essential underpinning of biomimicry um, because, because that's why organisms are the way they are so that they can meet specific functions. And when we find a match between functions in nature and a design need, then sometimes we can do that translation piece and identify relevant biological strategies and transform them into design solutions. So just let's practice this concept a little bit with some familiar designed objects. I realize we can't have a conversation exactly, but 
think about, you know, what's, what is the function of the pen on the left? I'm sure most of you are saying, you know, to be able to write or some variation on that, right? But what about the, there are a lot of pieces to that pen. What about the red part um, near the tip? What about the opposite end from the tip with the kind of like the blue button-like aspect, right? So function can be really tricky um, in terms of identifying what you want to do. And usually when you're, especially when you're a new practitioner to biomimicry, um, usually when you start, you can come up with, you know, 15 functions you want in a design. And you really have to try to hone in on what is the core function. So if the most important thing is that someone needs to be able to write um, or that the ink needs to, to move smoothly, you know, that's the first constraint. And then you can add on these other things or look at these additional things. Um, what about the umbrella? What do you think the function of an umbrella is? You know, most people would say, well, to keep the rain off, right? Or at least in Switzerland, um, certainly in Montana, although we don't get much rain here, so I rarely use one. Um, but in other countries, the primary function of an umbrella would probably be to keep off the sun right? And you might call it a sunshade, you might call it a different name, but it's essentially the same thing. But again, in biomimicry, context is really important. And, and we've, again, as humans, we're kind, we've kind of stopped paying attention to context in a lot of ways. If you visit new cities, relatively modern cities with skyscrapers, you know, a lot of them look the same. And sometimes you might see an iconic building, you know, designed by a famous architect. Um, but especially with global supply chains and global marketing, a lot of our stuff kind of is starting to look the same, right? And it's not necessarily designed for our specific context, um, especially at the level of, of buildings and cities, I would say. Um, so anyway, this is, this is a core practice of biomimicry is learning to identify function. It can be a lot harder when you have something more complex like a city. So what is the function of a city? And again, you could come up with, with all sorts of things, right? Like you may have to um, recycle waste, transport goods, um, move people, create community. You could come up with all sorts of functions, right? And so nature doesn't design top down. It doesn't necessarily think, well, how would I create a, a great city? And most cities aren't built that way either, right? They develop kind of organically, but that can also lead to problems. So if you were to truly design a biomimetic city, you might want to look at the underlying rules that apply to ecosystems in nature, for example. Can you create the conditions that would allow a flourishing city to emerge and ecosystem services to occur naturally? So again, I don't want you to like get bogged down on thinking, well, how could we apply biomimicry to a city? I just want you to recognize um, that it's very different from um, some other more concrete functions, right? So if you, depending on what scale you want to apply biomimicry, you may have to think about the problem a bit differently. Um, so as in the title, I've, I've talked a little bit about emulation already and sort of what is and isn't biomimicry. And a lot of that sort of falls to emulation. And this is really where we started to focus in the early days of the Biomimicry Institute was on that, that innovation. But there's really a core piece that underlies everything, the reconnection and ethos that lead to emulation. Um, and this was, this was clear in Janine Benyus's book. She's the co-founder of the Biomimicry Institute um, and wrote the book Biomimicry that kind of made this movement to this modern movement of looking to nature um, to inform human design popular. And so these, these things were really inherent in her book and we wanted to draw them out um, and not have people just focus on the emulation but also what was behind it. So these three seeds of biomimicry are sometimes what we talk about. So reconnection, here are some of the big ideas behind reconnection really that humans are part of nature. We are not separate from nature. Um, you know, I often talk about how humans have a lot of maladapted designs 
they're natural, but they're maladapted. They're not really designed to fit in. Um, so how do we get to well-adapted design? There's also with reconnection, this recognition that humans need nature to live, um, not just to use for our goods, but we actually need the services that nature provides and we need those in perpetuity. Um, so how do we ensure that we have that? Um, with kids especially, but also also with you, you know, I really want you to get excited about nature and, and be able to identify and observe the nature around you. And then finally, there's this idea that healthy ecosystems are models of abundance. You can have enough food and clean water um, and pure air, you know, all at the same time. You don't have to pollute one system in order to achieve one of those other goals. So um, one of the things we talk about is that um, life creates conditions conducive to life. And so how can we do that as well? Ethos is really about um, fostering care and concern, almost an empathy for nature. Um, there was a university class, I think in the Boston area of the US recently, um, instead of practicing human-centered design, they worked on a project um, with a lens of beaver centered design. So if we were to design for the beavers, if we were to design for the wildlife around us or that should be around us, what would our designs look like? And I think ethos, um, I think that really kind of captures ethos nicely. So our systems should not diminish or harm natural systems or people and communities. Um, you know, we should understand that our actions impact the ecosystems and the planet and also that we can play a role in creating positive change. And so emulation I've talked about a little bit already. That's really about identifying the functions both in nature and for my own needs, for my own designs, recognizing that context or the environment is really critical to why many functions or traits exist in organisms or ecosystems and making that connection between um, functions in the natural world and human needs or functions. And then ideally you can use the tools of science to understand how natural systems organisms work, or you can work with scientists. Some of the best biomimetic designs really come from an interdisciplinary approach from having um, scientists, engineers, business people, um, designers, you know, all at the table talking together and learning each other's languages and sharing back and forth in order um, to really define a problem collectively and then identify possible solutions. And then applying ideas from the natural world to solve problems is sort of the, the final step really. So it's the one that gets talked about the most, but it's really um, kind of the final step. All right, so any questions so far about any of that? I'm looking at the chat and we don't have questions. Okay. But I see that uh, Jorge raised his hand. Uh, Jorge, you can unmute yourself and- uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Megan, for the presentation. It's very clear and I have been very curious about uh, the topic for a long time, but never got into finding information about it. You have a lot of that. Uh, question is, um, which, which have been your, let's say, success experiences in terms of uh, talking with manufacturers that can become really interested in the thing, and which have been the difficulties that you have found? Um, I have certainly been more focused on the education side of things, but I have I have, of course, worked with many companies as well. So I can share both my, you know, some of my personal experiences as well as um, just sort of general lessons from our sister organization, Biomimicry 3.8, which is a consultancy. Um, <clears throat> I would say in terms of many years of experience at the consultancy, 
often somebody at the company would get very excited about biomimicry, very excited about the possibilities. They would begin working with either Biomimicry 3.8 or the Biomimicry Institute, or maybe like-minded um, consultancies. And, you know, they would get this biological report because the biomimics would understand how to define function. They'd work with the companies on how to do that, try to hone in on, you know, what the functions were they actually were trying to achieve. And then, you know, hand over the biology and maybe with design ideas included. But then it was very hard for the companies to take those ideas and actually implement. Um, and that could be for many, many reasons, you know, the business cycle, budgets, turnover among people. Um, so so that was that was kind of a common finding that it was like, how do we get past this this chasm, right? It was kind of the chasm of um, you know, to achievement with biomimetic success. Um, and really the way that Biomimicry 3.8, the consultancy has been able to address that is to partner with larger entities for larger projects where they're involved from the very beginning. And so for example, Jacobs Engineering, a large international engineering firm, they might get a contract to do something and then they will have the biomimicry. They will have biomimicry be part of their process. So they also, Jacobs Engineering might ultimately have to deliver, deliver on some very specific things, but they will work with biomimicry 3.8 to find, um, find opportunities where, where biomimicry can inform the process or inform those, those ultimate deliverables. Um, I mean, IP can can certainly be a sticking point. On the Biomimicry Institute side, we've really tried to inform um, projects, corporate projects that don't involve IP, but may involve changing the whole industry. So for example, um, in my bio, we mentioned working on, on textiles at the moment. And so we've been looking at how decomposition actually happens in nature because the conversation is kind of around biodegradability, right? But really there's no biode biodegradability seems to be, we just can't see it anymore. We don't necessarily sorry, know. I, I have to ask you a question. What is, yes. the, what is IP? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Intellectual property. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that can, that can get in the way, <laughs> I would say sometimes of um, but on the on the textile project, we're really trying to inform sort of at a broader level. So because we are a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. um, we're not looking to, you know, develop a, a new type of cap for a bottle or something like that, right? Using biomimetic principles. Rather, we're trying to inform the larger corporate conversation. So that's exactly what we're doing with our textile work. But in terms of adoption, you know, it's going, it's going to take a while, I think, and it's going to take examples. Um, I think another thing that in the past um, prevented success, you know, was just this business case, right? Because you still, if you're a biomimetic startup company, you still have to face the same hurdles as any startup company, right? You have to get people to believe in you. You may need to get loans or you may need to secure venture capital. You may need access to experts, to scientific equipment. Um, manufacturing advice, all of these things. So, um, and then you have to, you often have to deal with university intellectual property as well, because many of the companies, which I'll talk about in a moment, not all of them, but many of the companies came spun out of university research. And so then that's an additional hurdle of, of having to navigate how to work with the university. Um, I don't know if I've, I have I have I answered your question enough. I mean, I think there are many reasons. Oh, no. Yes, you have end. answered my question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and my question was oriented that I do believe in what you are promoting, um, and um, it's quite uh, often a need to shift the direction of the energy. Let's say, like on the one hand, one develops an interest in strategy. And then you need uh, sometimes a different kind of people to champion that strategy that yes. have different intellectual tools that uh, have abilities that you don't know how to master. 
but uh, thank you very much. Yes, you did answer my question. Thanks. Okay, and thank you, thank you for adding that. I think that's exactly right. And I would love to see more people who understand or support biomimicry get involved in policy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so um, I think that's that's exactly right, your observation, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't want to monopolize you, so I shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll have some more time for conversation. So I'll I'll, I'll share a, a few more case studies, and I know I talked about several in the course of introducing biomimicry, um, but I'll just share a few more um, in depth. Um, I lost my I lost my company logo there, but this is Sharklet, and Using biomimicry, Sharklet has created micro pattern surfaces, as you see there on the right, um, that stay clean without using harsh cleaning agents or antibiotics. So high touch surfaces in places like hospitals frequently become contaminated with bacteria and the potential um, spread of disease causing bacteria is really an ongoing problem in hospitals. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar problem around the world. But if we use antimicrobial chemicals to clean those surfaces, then superbugs or highly resistant um, bugs can develop resistant to our antibiotics. So this surface treatment that Sharklet developed is based on the pattern of shark skin. So you see the shark there and it's very clean compared to other marine organisms, right? It doesn't have algae or barnacles or you know just stuff growing on it or clinging to it. And that's because of their denticles or you know, this teeth-like pattern that you see there behind the shark. And so there's a particular geometry to those teeth and the pattern of those teeth that prevents microbes from adhering. And if microbes can't ad adhere, then the other things that would feed on those microbes don't adhere either. Um, this is what's known as a platform technology. And I know that Sharklet has, has interest from hundreds of companies to apply this idea, to license this idea and apply it to everything from yoga mats to the outside of airplanes to not to prevent the superbugs in the case of airplanes, but to reduce the drag on the planes and, and save fuel. Um, so again, this is really, if you think about just the hospital case, our our strategy for the last hundreds of years, or not not too long, actually, we didn't know for a long time, but maybe maybe 150 years or 200 years, was to kill, right? To kill the pathogens, kill the pathogens, kill the pathogens. And if you ask, well, how would nature, you know, do that? Nature nature would never be like, well, we're just going to eliminate, you know, every microbe, and that's going to be the solution because that's impossible, right? And that's led to this development of superbugs. So again, it's a very different way of looking at the at the problem instead of asking you know how would how how can we kill these microbes the scientist who observed the shark asked how does that shark stay so clean and that's what led to this discovery um there are a series of of pax companies pax scientific is the the parent company and then one of the subsidiaries is pax water technologies so the company is all about efficient fluid dynamics. So um, moving both air and water. This was one of their first successes. Jay Harmon is the inventor. He's an Australian by birth, but he's based in, in the San Francisco area now. And this device on the right is the, the Lily impeller. It's, all, it's about like the size of my hand, maybe, yeah, somewhere around that size. Um, and this can be put into huge municipal water tanks, millions of gallons um, that need to be mixed and treated with chemicals and then sent out through the pipes to come out of our faucets. Um, because it's so efficient, it uses very little energy, um, the energy of three 100 watt light bulbs, traditional incandescent light bulbs, um, and much less uh, Fewer chemicals need to be used in the mixing tanks because it's also so efficient at, at mixing. And this technology you know, can be applied to fans, rotors, impellers, and that's exactly what, what PAX is doing. And to Jorge's question, you know, this is a case where it's been, even though the technologies are so much more efficient, it has been hard for PAX Scientific 
to break into some of these very traditional sort of established um, in industries. Um, all right, on the left there, meet the beautiful and deadly mantis shrimp. It can pulverize its prey with a punch that travels at speeds um, that are faster than a 22 caliber bullet. And it can do this over and over again without damaging its club. And the, the secret is there in the middle photograph, um, layers of chitin that are offset by about 15 degrees. So as, as the structure's built, every layer is, is turned by about 15 degrees. Um, and the, the actual, the actual shrimp structure is there on the right in B and um, photograph A is a model of that chitin built structure. So Helicoid Industries follows this blueprint to make stronger, more durable and lighter weight composites um, such as carbon fiber for wind turbines and airplanes. They currently have licensing deals with some sports equipment manufacturers because that is an easier industry to break into. And then they're conducting um, research within numerous industries. I think Helicoid Industries is going to be successful more quickly than some other biomimetic companies. And again, not because they're biomimetic, but just because of how, how hard it can be to, to establish an industry or business in the first place. Um, but I think there are two things in their favor. One is um, this deal with sports equipment manufacturers, right? So allowing them to get established um, with a lower entry barrier but then also being able to plug into existing composite machinery and processes, and then potentially have a huge impact um, on industries that really sort of make or break themselves on the cost of materials. So that's my, that's my guess. <laughs> um, InCycle is a system, um, that was invented based on swarm algorithms from swarming organisms. So if you think about the way birds fly or ant school or how ants can travel without walking all over each other, these swarm technologies of many organisms sort of moving in, in concert without crashing into each other has informed this energy management system. So this little device basically talks to all, all of the appliances in large industrial buildings and it, it manages when they are turned on in order to most efficiently use energy. And it has constraints, so it will never turn off a refrigerator and allow things to spoil or to drop below a certain temperature, but it will help manage peak loads. And when you're using a lot of energy and everyone else in the system is using a lot of energy and you're drawing from peak loads, that's when the most polluting sources of energy are used. So if we're all using sort of a minimum amount of energy and there's solar and wind power coming in, you know, maybe we only have to use the solar and wind, but if all of a sudden everyone's energy use spikes, um, that's when we tend to revert to our, our dirtier energy systems. So this device manages, um, manages energy use for large industrial users. And again, I think they had a number of challenges breaking into the system, but now I think their strategy is to is to offer this technology as like fee for service, right? So they say, we'll save you so much energy and then you pay us kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, you need to buy this product and see if it works. Um, and so I think that's helped them become more successful as well. So imagine if carbon dioxide was a resource, if we thought of it as a resource instead of a pollutant. That's actually how most of life on Earth has evolved to work. So every plant on the planet uses carbon dioxide as a building block, and it combines it with water and sunlight to make energy and tissues. Um, Blue Planet is a company that learned from corals how to use carbon dioxide to create cement and aggregate at low temperature from carbon dioxide and the minerals in seawater. So cement, which is essentially calcium carbonate, is one of the most widely used building materials in history and that usage is just increasing, yet it requires mining limestone and then heating it to um, 
over 2000 degrees Celsius. Um, this process uses fossil fuels, of course, and as a result, the production of one ton of cement releases at least one ton of carbon dioxide. And the aggregate that goes into concrete has huge energy costs in terms of transportation. So Blue Planet's bio-inspired approach actually sequesters carbon, at least half a ton of carbon dioxide, um, at least half a ton of carbon per ton of cement produced. Um, and again, it's this, it's this flipping of a switch. Um, carbon dioxide is a resource for a building plant, for a building material for all these plants. How can we also think about carbon as a building material instead of a pollutant? And obviously we have to think about it as a pollutant right now as well. But if we can sequester more of, car more of the carbon that's out there into materials, it will help restore the balance faster. And again, I shared this example at the beginning. This is the John Todd eco machine, but I just wanted to show you, um, it can look, I think sometimes biomimetic technologies can look simplistic when I show you the photos, right? Like the bullet train, it's like, oh, well, of course you would design the train like that, right? But that actually took like 12 or more years of engineering to figure out exactly how the beak worked, how they would translate that into the train. Um, but in hindsight, it's often like, oh, that makes sense. And I think I think this can can look similar, this system. It's like, oh yeah, we'll just put some plants in, you know, and and treat our wastewater. Um, so I just wanted to show you what the inside of some of his of John Todd's systems look like. And you don't have to read all of that, but it's basically, you know, the water is moving from cell to cell. And there are different things happening in all of those cells. And there's a lot of surface area um, because that's how that's how nature cleans water is with a lot of surface area, a lot of places for these microbes to live and adhere. Um, so those were a few examples of, again, of mimicking form and one process, regen energy, and then, then this system as well. But to conclude the case studies, I just want to remind you that function underpins the emulation aspect of biomimicry. So instead of looking simply at the visual and aesthetic qualities of the biological world, again, biomimicry focuses on learning from how living things meet specific functions. And then when we find a match between those two, then we can sometimes make that translation. Um, this isn't necessarily a case study per se. I don't think that... Um, this was successful in the end, but I wanted to show you this system because it it looks a lot. This is this is a solar. These are solar leaves essentially on the right, and of course they look a lot like leaves on trees. And in my time here, I've seen students and professionals come up with hundreds of ideas about you know building solar trees on on streets and the like. And often I don't think they really get at sort of the deep function behind a tree and its leaves. But in some cases they do. And I believe this was students out of Pratt Institute um, came up with this design and it was modular. So it had different panels and you could pop out individual leaves as well as panels so that you could have um, some form of self repair just as leaves do. You know, each of those leaves could turn individually to um, optimize their orientation to the sun or optimize two conditions. And then the whole thing was designed to be dismantled at the end to make for easier recycling and such. And so I just I just always appreciate that example because again, it was students that came up with it, but they really put a lot of thought into the context in which they were designing. They were also taking advantage, you know, this was designed to go on the side of a building. So they were taking advantage of an underutilized niche. Um, anyway, so I always really loved this example, even though the students didn't, um, I think they formed a company, but then, you know, didn't didn't really carry it much beyond um, this prototype. But I really believe in the the power of students. And so I hope you'll feel inspired by that one, too. Um, OK, any any questions before I share a few tools and resources? I do have questions, but I think it will be better to ask them at the end. Okay, that's fine. All right, so 
This is called the biomimicry taxonomy, and I do not expect you to read that, so you don't even have to try. Um, but we found a really nice way to put all of a huge list of functions into a fairly compact area. And so that's exactly what this taxonomy does. It lists functions that can be found in nature and also functions that human designs also often seek to do. So there's sort of three levels. So I'll just share one at the top because it's easy to see. Um, so at the group level, I guess there's there are these eight categories, right? So move or stay put. Um, below that, protect from physical harm, maintain community. So at a very high level, what do you want your design to do? I want my design to move, you might say. Um, well, then a subgroup is move or attach. In this case, they're almost the same thing. So you still want to move. Well, then are you moving in or on solids, in or on liquids, in or through gases? And you can look for examples on Ask Nature of how organisms do that. But also if you're having trouble identifying functions, if you're trying to use biomimicry and you keep getting hung up on, well, let's design an air conditioner, you know, um, then you can think about, well, how would nature say that? And temperature is actually a really good one. So um, I think we have, I'm not actually sure what that's under, but you know, managing temperature is a way to think about how nature deals with temperature, right? If you look at, well, how do organisms cool off or how, how do organisms stay warm, you won't get the breadth of answers. So again, I'm just saying, as you identify functions, as you learn to do that, you will very likely have to, you know, get narrower, go broader, get narrower, go broader, um, converge and diverge until you get to um, a function that feels right given, given your context. Um, so Ask Nature, I mentioned, it's the Biomimicry Institute's free catalog of biological information that's organized by function. Um, it also features many innovation pages. So if you'd like to see additional case studies, um, including from our Ray of Hope Prize competition, which celebrates young biomimetic companies, um, there are collections of those on Ask Nature that you can visit. And there's also a resource library for educators. Um, I haven't actually looked at it in a while. I think more of the more of the materials might be directed um, at K through 12 educators, but I'm sure there are also some things that are of interest at the university level. Um, so again, asknature.org. It can look like this if you search for biological strategies. Um, so in this case, you know, I did search on keep cool, and this is what the system returned to me. I have a strategy, I have a strategy on how otters and seals stay cool, how a camel's fur coat keeps it cool, bark, because plants often, you know, we don't think about plants having to deal with the same conditions we do, but often there are very interesting strategies from plants that we as animals um, don't think of as readily. Um, so anyway, you can see at the top there, um, if I put my pointer here, you know, it returned 23 biological strategies, three innovations, one collection, and one resource. And so you can click through those to see any of these things that are specifically related to keeping cool. And this is the taxonomy um, here. So even though it's keep cool that I searched on, there are related functions so maybe because nature does multifunctional design, right? So maybe as nature is keeping cool, it's also processing information, or maybe it keeps cool in order to prevent physical harm. And so you can click on any of these plus signs to expand. And you can also see that there are 16 animals um, and five plants in that solution. And here's the strategy page itself. So if I if I click through on how a camel's fur keeps it cool, then I would, I would get this um, expanded strategy. And that actually continues quite a bit farther down and it has references at the bottom so that you can go and see um, the actual scientific papers that it came from. We've also been adding a lot of illustrations that try to explain how the biology works because especially if you're not a biologist, I'm assuming most of you are not, um, the science can be really tricky, right, to really figure it out and apply it well. So we're adding more illustrations to help with that translation piece. How do you take something from the biological realm and apply it in the design realm? 
We also have a free biomimicry toolbox that's at toolbox.biomimicry.org. And that's where you can expand on almost everything I've said today. So an introduction to biomimicry, the core, the core concepts, especially of emulation, right? Um, and then the methods for doing it. How, how do you practice, um, how do you actually go out and learn to observe in nature? There are resources for that in the biomimicry toolbox. How do you define the question you wanna answer at sort of the right scale, the right level? Um, and then what is, was it, what is the context you need to think about? And there's an extensive section on something we call nature's unifying patterns. And these are really deep principles that are derived from nature at a large scale, how nature functions sort of across the board that can inform your design models, your business models, um, the context in which you're designing. So I could do a whole session on these patterns, um, but overall for now, you can just look at them for a moment and know that they provide a unique way to approach and think about whatever your design challenge is. And so if you have some of these ideas in mind before you design anything, I think you'll be more likely, you know, to achieve them. And the toolbox has a lot more detail on all of these. I'll just mention a, two that I think are, are particularly, particularly hard in some ways. Nature uses chemistry and materials that are safe for living beings. Um, if you're not a chemist and if you're, school doesn't have a huge sustainable materials library, it can be very, very hard um, to find chemistry and materials that are safe for living beings. So then you might wanna think about, well, how do I minimize the materials that have to go into my design, right? So I just wanna acknowledge that that one is really challenging. And also I wanna acknowledge that I think we at the Biomimicry Institute need to expand on nature recycles all materials. Um, if you haven't heard about it in the last few years, we've, at least, especially in the United States, we've been duped about recycling, right? The recycling industry paid a lot of money to lobby government to um, make claims about recycling and recyclable materials that aren't true. It's very, very hard to recycle things in the United States for sure, even though they have the little recycling symbol, supposedly. Um, but it's not actually a recycling symbol, which is part of the. <laughs> so anyway, this is all to say, it's very easy to say, well, it'll be recycled, right? But you have to think about the context in which your design is going to end up. Is your design going to end up in another city, another country, across the ocean? Um, are microfibers from your textiles going to end up in the oceans of Antarctica, right? So Nature recycles all materials. I just want to offer some caution. Um, we really, we all really need to expand our thinking around what does that mean and how does that happen? So I'll just point out those two for now, but you can go check out a lot more details on the toolbox. And so to conclude, ultimately biomimicry is really about how can we fit in as elegantly, fit in on the planet as elegantly as the living systems that surround us. So ponder that the next time you walk through your neighborhood or go for a hike. And don't be afraid to look to the many biological mentors around you. They're ready to share their secrets with us. <laughs>